Go. Got it. Go. Fido. Go. Prop. Go. GNC. Go. Max. Go. Eagle. Go. Ecom. Go. FAO. Go. Payloads. Go. It's a great day to go fly. So on behalf of the KSC Processing and Launch Team, I'd like to wish you, your crew, and the whole Hubble Space Telescope team a, a great mission. Good luck, Godspeed, and we'll see you back here in about 11 days. Drew Feustel is an American geoscientist who in 2009 did something that very few human beings had done before him. Drew left the Earth on a NASA mission to the Hubble Space Telescope where he carried out a series of spacewalks to repair this iconic instrument. Drew then returned to space in May 2011 where he served as the lead spacewalker on Endeavour's final mission to the International Space Station. Back here on Earth, Drew has joined me to talk about these incredible experiences. Hi Drew, nice to meet you. Thanks James, thanks for the introduction. So how does one go from being a geoscientist to becoming an astronaut? That's a, that's a great question and one that's hard to answer. And my, my, uh, my standard answer is you simply apply to the program. Uh, but the real answer is I think it uh, requires a, a drive and interest from an early age and some imagination as to what other possibilities are out there for for each of us and, and holding on to someone's dreams. So you're sitting there in a the rocket before the first mission is about to take off. I mean, what's going through your mind in those last few moments? Well, we get into the vehicle to the space shuttle about three hours before launch and we lay on our backs in our spacesuits. And uh, many of us, including myself, actually fall asleep during that period because there's not a lot going on, which is, you'd find surprising. But uh, when you train for a mission for three years, uh, I think you're, by the time they're going to put you into the, uh, into the rocket and launch off into space, you're ready to go. Uh, so for myself, it's a, it was a very calming experience, uh, leading right up to the point where they started the countdown uh, inside the spacecraft. So especially when they get down to the, uh, the number 10. And when they, any time before that, you realize that they could probably stop the count and something could go wrong. And you don't really believe that the launch is going to happen because you've waited all this time to get into space. But when they get to 10 and then they keep going down to 1, uh, you realize that somebody's serious about putting you into space. And then when they get to zero and, uh, and the rocket lights and it hits you in the back like someone smacked you with a, with a frying pan, uh, you realize that now's the time and you're going to space and you're no longer going to stay on the planet. <laughs> it's a pretty exciting ride. <laughs> so tell me about your first mission from 2009 to Hubble. What were you sent there to do? Well, we were uh, sent up to really rescue a dying satellite. Uh, Hubble had, uh, we think, only a few more, more years left with the uh, batteries that were on the, uh, on the craft, and it works much like your cell phone or anything else. We recharge the batteries all the time. Just the International Space Station operates the same way. We've got batteries on board and solar panels that collect solar energy, and uh, so the batteries on Hubble were failing, and we knew that. And each time the batteries degrade, um, they have to reduce the amount of energy that they take from them, so the science Re is reduced as well by proportion based on how much energy they have to, s to uh, feed those systems. So um, Hubble needed new batteries and it, and it got some upgrades on some of the scientific instruments. And did you feel a uh, great pressure given the iconic status of this telescope? Yeah, we did. It. We, we realized how important Hubble is. Uh, it's probably, uh, we believe, one of the most important scientific instruments that humans have ever built. Um, it's taught us more about the solar system um, the beginning origins of, uh, of the space, the universe that we live in, and also about our future. Um, so Hubble was very important to humankind, and I think we all recognize that. And we also realized this was the last time with the eventual and now uh, retirement of the space shuttles uh, we had work to do, and it was critical for us to get the job done and get it done right while we were there. And how about your second mission earlier this year to the International Space Station? What were you sent there to do? The missions were totally different, uh, and, and the only thing uh, that I can say about the two that was similar is the fact that they were both performed in space. Um, the International Space Station is a magnificent uh, spacecraft. It's uh, about the size of a five-bedroom home uh, in, in living space, and overall dimensions, it's larger than a soccer field. Uh, so for us to go there and see that in space was just spectacular. Um, it orbits the planet uh, about 100 miles closer to the Earth, so it's, it's 200 miles up. Hubble Space Telescope is about 300 miles up above the planet. Um, 
And what's neat about the space station is that you can actually fly in it. You can fly right down the middle of the, of the structure um, and really get that feel for weightlessness. And also, when we do our spacewalks, it's easy to get lost out there because it's such an enormous uh, vehicle. Uh, and everything looks the same. It's very symmetrical. One side of the spacecraft looks the same as the other. So when you're out there working and it gets dark at night, you really have to remember where you're going else you'll get lost. <laughs> uh, the most important thing about spacewalks is to not let go uh, because you don't want to separate yourself from the, the vehicle that uh, has your ride back to the planet Earth. Um, but uh, because we train so hard, we really do focus on the task when we get out there. We know that once we put the space suit on and go outside, um, that over a six and a half or seven hour period, we have to get everything done that we trained for. If we don't get it done, the telescope would be, le would be left incomplete. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. In over five space walk, we, sh we finished that work. But on the space station, if you don't get the work done, you're really just kicking the can down the road for somebody else to try to get that task completed. And there's always a risk involved when somebody goes outside. So now that the space shuttles have been retired, are you sad about that? I'm not sad about it. Uh, I really think that the Space Shuttle did the job it was intended to do, which was uh, to build the International Space Station. Now, obviously, we used it to, to uh, service Hubble five times, uh, but we believe we've left it in the state that we need to before the next generation, uh, which is the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, comes along. Uh, but for Space Station, we think the assembly is complete, and that's what uh, the Space Shuttle was designed to do. Uh, it also doesn't have any capability to go further than low Earth orbit. So in order to fly a spacecraft to back to the moon and uh, potentially onto Mars, we need another spaceship. And uh, that's why we've had to retire the shuttles, is to, to build something else. And that's what we're trying to do. And there's a referred camera view of the uh, Space Shuttle Endeavour as it's coming in for a landing. Gear down and locked. And so after a journey of six and a half million miles, Endeavour landing in darkness, but illuminated by the ingenuity, dedication of every astronaut, scientist, engineer, flight controller, mechanic and dreamer that helped it fly. The fleet's youngest ship completing its 122 millionth mile after its crew delivered an instrument to the International Space Station that will sift through the cosmic darkness for years to come. So you've been to space twice, uh, coming back down to Earth. Has that changed the way in which you see the planet? Uh, it helps me to realize how fragile it is. Uh, the, the world that we live in has its own uh, spacecraft, if you would, that protects us from the vacuum of space, and we call that the Earth's atmosphere. And nowhere on the ground can you really see the atmosphere except that we see the blue sky. But when you're in space and you look down upon the planet, you can easily see that thin veil that separates us from the vacuum of space. And uh, you realize how fragile it is and how important it is for us to protect the planet. This is the only planet we've got. This is the only place that we call home. And when you see it floating in space, uh, you realize how isolated we are among the, the vast infinity of, uh, of what space is. I mean, it is infinite. There's a lot of space in space, and we're just a small part of it. Do you have any advice for high school students who, who dream of one day going to space? I do, and uh, what I would say was that I never really knew what my path to spaceflight would be, but I knew that I believed that it would be a part of my life. And so for people who have those dreams and really have some sense for what they want to do, some mission or goal in their lives, that to just hold on to it, there doesn't have to be a dedicated path. There doesn't have to be a, a well-thought-out, designed uh, um, way to get to where they think they're going to go. But if they pursue the things that they enjoy, um, if they enjoy those things, they'll be good at them. If they're good at them, they'll excel at those things, and ultimately they'll reach those goals. So I would just say uh, stay with the program and uh, keep that long-term goal in mind.